Paris. Restaurants and romance, empire and opera, fun surprising experiences at every one of the more than 300 stops on the metro. My name is Lisa. I'm a writer and tour guide. I carry a Canadian passport, but all we'll need is a ticket for the metro system as I show you historic, inspirational, endlessly fabulous Paris. I'd like to share my love for this spectacular city with you, one stop after the next, by way of the exciting Paris metro system. So grab your French phrase book and put on your walking shoes. We're going to Paris. Next stop, Charles de Gaulle Etoile. This time, we'll be checking out the many things to do and see around one of the most iconic intersections in Paris. We'll stroll famous boulevards and visit the historic, delightful businesses that line the streets. We'll taste timeless Parisian treats, and we'll remember the brave souls who fought for this magnificent city. All this and one of the most recognizable monuments anywhere as I continue to show you the most gorgeous city in the world. Charles de Gaulle Etoile is a metro station designed under the busiest intersection in Paris, which circles around the Arc de Triomphe. Now, this Place de l'Etoile, the star, was designed in 1854 with the five boulevards spinning away from the Arc de Triomphe. However, in 1970, it was renamed for the president and war hero Charles de Gaulle, who died that year. So today, from this metro station, let's see what the neighborhood has to offer us. The distinctive star-shaped intersection at Place de l'Etoile was little more than an intersection of hunting paths long before Paris grew into the amazing urban icon that it is today. During the 17th century, the Royal Tuileries Palace was graced with huge wooded parklands that stretched nearly three kilometers from the palace to a small hill crowned by intersecting paths. Louis XIV's landscape architect, André Le Neutre, then designed magnificent planted avenues between the fields. In 1694, the largest of these was named the Champs-Élysées. 100 years later, city planners tried to select a perfect structure to grace the center of the Place de l'Étoile. But several projects were rejected, including this giant elephant-shaped building. Finally, in 1806, Emperor Napoleon decided to begin construction of a massive arch glorifying his armies after their victories over the Austrians and the Russians. Over the years, the original five boulevards have multiplied to become 12, causing a unique traffic situation that persists to this day, much to the horror and amazement of visitors to the City of Light. Unlike traffic roundabouts in the rest of Paris and France, and in fact the rest of the world, the huge roundabout in the center of Place de l'Etoile has rules all its own. In most places, the traffic already on the circle has the right of way. This way, people on the circle can move through and clear the intersection before new vehicles enter and take their turn. However, in Place de l'Etoile, the traffic coming in from the right has the right of way. So if you're stuck on the inside lane and someone coming from the right decides they want in, well, it's just your tough luck. Of course, Parisian drivers add their own distinct touch to the motorized mayhem. The 12 streets leading into the Etoile are named for Napoleon's victories. One can't help but notice that there is a slight tension of conflict in the air along with the exhaust here. Better to visit this area on foot and enjoy the rich details of Paris rather than braving the roads and risk shortening your stay, if not your life. Let's catch our breath for a moment just a few steps from the Place de l'Etoile on the famous Champs-Élysées Boulevard. 
here, you'll find a true Paris classic, the Publicis Drugstore. This rather amazing place doesn't seem to be able to decide what it is exactly. Among other things, it's a combination newsstand, bar, pharmacy, gift shop, and deli. All this and they are open until 2 in the morning. When Publicis first opened in the 1950s, the creators imagined a single location to hang out, enjoy a drink, and shop, all conveniently located on one of the world's most glamorous boulevards. More than 50 years later, Publicis Drugstore is still serving its eclectic selection of goods and services while keeping up to date with the latest trends. Pick up a newspaper from back home in the international newsstand or peruse the books in the bookshop, which has an interesting literary selection with a focus on titles about Paris. You'll be tempted by the fine foods and wines on offer. Or perhaps the vast selection of cigars. And yes, there is even a pharmacy at the drugstore, making this a true one-stop shop. In the evening, the two cinemas are a popular feature, and you don't even have to leave the premises to take in the film. This is a great place to sit out a rain shower or just enjoy a little Parisian people watching. Be sure to pop into Le Drugstore when you step out at Charles de Gaulle metro station. Publicis Drugstore was opened in 1958 and it's known as Le Drugstore by locals. It was renovated in 2004 by the American architect Michael Sayi. His facade behind me is supposed to float like an angel over the boulevard. Whether or not the design of the exterior refurbishment manages to take on angelic characteristics remains the subject of some debate. Some visitors appreciate the curved metal frame holding the glass panels that have a digitally inspired etched pattern. But others miss the original exterior, which is still somewhat visible behind the adornment. Now, Parisians feel that during the renovation, the late night pharmacy, bar, and gift shop lost a little bit of its personality. But it's still the best place to grab a coffee before heading out to explore the Arc de Triomphe. That is just what we'll be doing right after this. A station in the gorgeous and exciting city of Paris. Inarguably, the Arc de Triomphe at the center of this busy intersection is one of the most recognizable features of Paris. It was Napoleon who thought to put a big triumphal arch up here in 1806, even though there was nothing here other than cows and green fields. Now, Napoleon never saw the Arc de Triomphe completed. It was only finished under Louis-Philippe in 1836. And finally, Napoleon's funeral cortege passed through the arch in 1840. In a country with many photogenic monuments, the Arc de Triomphe comes second in visitors only to the Abbey of Mont Saint-Michel, with countless visitors pausing to snap a memory day after day. striking symbol of the pride of the French state has witnessed many important events in the last two centuries of the history of France. The Arc de Triomphe is 50 meters high and if you want to visit the viewing platform at the top and the historical exhibit, you have to walk up the stairs. Now to get to the Arc de Triomphe, you have to take this tunnel behind me because otherwise you're running through eight lanes of Parisian traffic and you do not want to do that. The 
pedestrian tunnel will take you safely to the base of the Arc de Triomphe, where you'll need to pay a small fee to enter the structure and climb the 40 steps to the observation deck. If the climb to the top doesn't take your breath away, the view of Paris from the summit will certainly do so. From this unique vantage point, you'll be able to truly appreciate the star-shaped symmetry of the city below, with its grand boulevards stretching out in all directions. To the north, you can see all the way to the Arc de la Défense, or La Grande Arche, which stands roughly twice the size of the Arc de Triomphe and was completed in 1989 to honor the bicentennial of the French Revolution. The Arc de Triomphe is open to visitors every day from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m., and admission is free to those under 17. A visit to the Arc de Triomphe observation deck is a great alternative to the often more crowded Tour Eiffel sky deck. Set into the pavement at the foot of the Arc de Triomphe, you'll find brass plaques commemorating important moments in French and European history over the last century. One of these plaques bears the entire text of the 1940 broadcast by General de Gaulle on the BBC from London. It bears the words, come what may, the flame of the French resistance must not and will not be extinguished. There is another flame that will never go out here as well. The one that marks the tomb of the unknown soldier. The flame was first ignited the 11th of November, 1923, and has burned brightly ever since, even during the occupation of Paris during the Second World War. To this day, every single day at 6.30 p.m., veterans associations gather under the arch here and tend the eternal flame to honor the war dead. The tomb contains the remains of an unknown soldier killed in action in the Battle of Verdun in 1916 and honors the memory of all the unidentified victims of war. Parisians of all ages hold the memory of the unknown soldier very dearly. This respect is perhaps the only force capable of stopping traffic on the Place de l'Etoile because each day the cars momentarily stop their perpetual motion and allow those taking part in the ceremony to walk through. This is how it has been and will continue to be as long as there are people who cherish the memory of those who gave their lives so that we may live in a free and just society. After a visit to the somber side of Paris around the Charles de Gaulle Etoile metro station, Let's take a walk along what some people call the most famous street in the world. They may or may not be right, but one thing is for sure. You'll find some of the highest commercial rents anywhere on earth right here. I'm going to take you window shopping right after this. Welcome back to frenetic, fashionable, fabulous Paris. I'd like to take you on a walk down one of the most entertaining thoroughfares in the city. The Champs-Élysées has been called one of the most beautiful avenues in the world. And certainly, during the Second Empire, this boulevard was fabulous. There were beautiful mansions, elegant shops, chic restaurants. Then, 
During the 20th century, the Champs-Élysées went into a gradual decline. It became a little bit grotty until by the 1990s it was decided the Champs needed a facelift. So they widened the sidewalks, they installed wonderful kiosks and newspaper stands in the feel of the Second Empire to encourage people to flâner down the boulevard or stroll and look into different kinds of shops. These days we have high-end things like Louis Vuitton, but we also have chain shops and yes, you can even eat at McDonald's. I personally prefer to pick up pastry at places like La Durée. not have heard of La Durée, but I'm willing to bet you've seen the product they made famous. This maker of exquisite cakes and pastries is credited with the invention of the icing-filled macaron cookie, and they sell at least 15,000 of them per day. Once you've tasted one for yourself, you'll know why. The interior of La Durée is as sweet on the eyes as the products are on the palate. There are opulently detailed dining rooms found on the upper level. And those wishing to buy their macaron to go can do so from the gorgeous marble and gold leaf pastry counter at ground level. to soak up a little ambience, so I'm taking a seat upstairs to enjoy my coffee and a few macarons. Yes. Merci. Oh, this looks wonderful. One of the reasons I love ordering coffee here is because everything comes with its own little handle holder because, of course, the coffee container is silver, the handle gets hot, so they have a little L holder for la durée, but I secretly think it's L for Lisa because that's my initial. And the coffee here is wonderful. A lot of businessmen, oddly enough, come here for breakfast in the morning, but this is a wonderful tea room for coffee and tea in the afternoon. The famous macaron come in a rainbow of flavors including one that changes with the seasons. And right now they have the Marie Antoinette, the uh, blue macaron, which is apparently rose flavored. We'll find out. Mm. Hmm. Oh, it's really complicated. It's delicious. Hmm. I also have a classic rose macaron. The pink one, of course. Rose flavors at La Durée are very traditional. They have all sorts of rose-flavored pastries. And they also have other kinds of flower pastries, orange flower, violet, and so forth. So it's a real treat to have these unusual flavors as dessert. La Durée has been an institution in Paris for well over a century and has spread its sweet goodness all over the world. In fact, they opened a Hong Kong location in 2012. La Durée is among a host of premier retail spaces that line the Champs-Élysées. The astronomical rents make for rather well-heeled tenants, serving the finest to discerning clients from all over the world. In more recent years, global chain stores have started setting up shop on the Champs as well. Many of these speak to the Champs-Élysées link to great sports events. The Paris Marathon runs a route which includes this thoroughfare, and the Tour de France bicycle race finishes here near the Arc de Triomphe. The Champs-Élysées has been featured in countless movies. One of my favorite film scenes is from Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, where the heroine is on the Champs-Élysées selling Herald Tribune newspapers in front of a car showroom, and the hero shows up on the run from the law. Now in 
fact, the Champs Elysees always had car showrooms. The big three French manufacturers, Citroën, Peugeot, and Renault, have always liked to display their latest designs here. Now today, they're still here, so let's go see what Peugeot has to offer us. The Peugeot showroom on the Champs Elysees always dramatically displays not only the vehicles they offer, but also has clever art installations which change regularly. So even if you've visited before, it's worth coming back a little later to see what's new. Many people visit the showroom every year, as I learned when I spoke with Peugeot representative Rita Rodriguez Rivero. We have a lot of visitors, around 3 million visitors by the year. Here on the Champs Elysees. Here in the Champs Elysees. Wow. Here in the Peugeot Avenue showroom. And uh, we have a lot from uh, North America. 28% of visitors come from North America. North American visitors may find the look of Peugeot a little unusual. But chances are, if you rent a car while in Paris, you'll be handed the keys to a Peugeot. What did surprise me was that Peugeot had been in business for over half a century before they started making cars. And here at the showroom, you can purchase the company's original products, coffee mills. That's right, it all started from a family coffee mill business back in 1810. They eventually branched out into salt and pepper mills and then into bicycles before taking on the automobile. Really what I want is to sit in this one. This classic 1975 504 Cabriolet is not for sale. But the showroom does offer miniatures of all its past models and displays the gorgeous hood ornaments which have graced the company's cars over the years. And a I decided to join most visitors to Peugeot's Champs-Élysées location and pick out something a little more in line with my budget to take home with me. I'll have to come back some other time for that sports coupe I had my eye on. So I have my pepper and salt shakers, and now I'm really hungry. So let's see where we can eat on the Champs-Élysées. I hope you have an appetite too. I've made reservations at a real celebrity of a restaurant right after this. We're in the most fabulous city on earth, Paris, and we've been discovering the rich culture and history of the area around the Charles de Gaulle Etoile metro station. This is Fouquet's on the Champs Elysees, and it opened in 1899. It was really popular from the get go. In fact, it was the headquarters for partying for World War I fighter pilots. These days, and in fact for the last 30 years, this is the restaurant where the French movie stars come to party after the César, which is the French version of the Academy Awards. And I personally am a little bit hungry, so let's see what they've got. Being able to say that you had a meal in the same place that once hosted the men who flew their biplanes up against the notorious German airmen of the First World War just about makes up for the prices at Fouquet's, where a simple espresso shot sells for eight euros. But you didn't come to Paris to save money, so just soak up the amazing atmosphere and try not to think of the peanut butter sandwiches you'll have to eat all next January to pay for your trip. The waiter brought me uh, ravioli with lobster with a crustacean emulsion on top of it, so I'm going to try it. Oh, the emulsion is wonderful. It's very lobstery. I think I've still got to try the ravioli, though. It looks great. Mmm. 
Oh, it's wonderful. It's really lobstery. It's great. Fouquet's has taken its role as the host of the French movie star set in a big way. The walls are filled with the images of beloved stars of France, more than a few of whom have dined here. And the front entry boasts the names of the world's great cinema stars set into bold brass plaques on either side of the red carpet that brings you into this iconic Paris eatery. So Fouquet's has brought me their, one of their specialties. It's a sea bass à l'ancienne, basically an old style sea bass. Let's see how it is. Oh, it's really good. It's not overcooked, which I hate. So this is perfect. In 2006, Fouquet's decided to expand, taking its history as a restaurant and adding a luxury hotel. This is the Champs-Élysées Golden Triangle of fashion and money, so the design of the hotel had to reflect its location, as I learned from Fouquet's representative, Stéphane Trisionka. The design of the hotel is a, is a Parisian prowess. It's so difficult to build new places in the city. Uh, well, the owners decided to put together five different buildings. So they put together these five uh, different constructions together and then decided to make it a luxury hotel behind the reputation of what has been on the Champs-Élysées, the Fouquet's, the restaurant, has been on the Champs-Élysées for 120 years. So it made sense to build behind it something that would be, you know, um, using this reputation and ambition. The hotel includes buildings from the elegant mid-1800s houseman era and construction from the 1970s, so creating a luxurious environment that reflected the Fouquet's history wasn't easy. But the result is an opulent hotel with all the high-end touches you'd expect from rooms that start at close to a thousand euros per night. If a five-star hotel is a little out of your reach when you visit Paris, be sure to drop in for a meal, or at the very least, dessert, so you can enjoy a little taste of Fouquet's famous luxury while you're here. Oh, it's really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's continue our tour of the area around the Charles de Gaulle metro station with a walk in one of the small, elegant parks to be found in the neighborhood. This is Place des Etats-Unis, which used to be known as Place de la Beach. But the Americans, when they moved their embassy here in 1881, didn't like the sound of beach, which means deer. So the place was renamed Place des Etats-Unis. And today, around the square, you can see different statues commemorating the friendship between France and the US. One of the most striking and impressive of these is the statue of George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette. The representation of the two leaders shaking hands in front of the flags of their nations is the work of famed sculptor Frederick Auguste Bartholdi, the same artist responsible for the colossal French gift to the United States, the Statue of Liberty. The statue was commissioned by New York World editor Joseph Pulitzer and presented as a gift of gratitude for the French role of support in the United States' War of Independence. Despite being the work of such a renowned sculptor as Bartholdi, the statue was initially not warmly received when it was unveiled in 1892. Here you can also see the 1923 Jean Boucher statue entitled Memorial to the American Volunteers, which honors the Americans who volunteered to fight in the service of France during the First World War. You can also see the Baccarat Museum, which used to be the personal mansion of Marie-Laure 
de Noy, who is a great patron of the avant-garde arts and threw fabulous parties here in surrealistic costume. She was a big friend of Dali's. In 2003, Philip Stark was hired to renovate the museum and turn it into a building suitable to display the Baccarat Crystal Collection. The luxury brand Baccarat was established in Baccarat, France in 1764. The company manufactures and sells jewelry, home decorations, and lighting, with the common element in all of these being the impeccable crystal. Philippe Stark restored the mansion into a home for the Baccarat Museum, but the designer also cleverly included surreal references to the building's previous aristocratic owner. The wonderful things made by Baccarat come in many shapes and colors, but the keen-eyed expert will always look for the telltale red bead incorporated into a piece which tells them that this is indeed a real Baccarat. The trademark red color comes from adding gold to the crystal's manufacturing process. This historic company survived the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. They made simple utility glassware like bottles and tableware for many years before going into lead crystal making. Eventually, their products became renowned works of crystal art that graced the tables of royalty of Europe and beyond. The mansion on Place des États-Unis houses the Baccarat Museum and also the Crystal Room Restaurant. A meal here will make you feel like you're dining in a fairy tale. The room is filled with glittering Baccarat crystal and the food served is nothing short of Parisian perfection. You'll want to linger over your meal and stretch out the experience in this decadent room. Baccarat creations turn up in the most luxurious homes in the world, but the sparkle of Baccarat crystal has moved to a more personal scale recently. The historic company has branched out into jewelry making. If you can't see yourself spending the half million dollars or so on an original 1950s Baccarat chandelier, perhaps the more modestly priced jewelry collection will be a perfect souvenir for you or just stick to the highly affordable, extravagant Baccarat Museum itself, which will only set you back five euros. If Baccarat has put you in the mood for shopping, let's walk over to the business street where the locals shop, where Parisians go to pick up what they need right after this. exploring Paris one metro stop at a time. Today, we're looking at what we can find in the area around the Charles de Gaulle Etoile metro station, a place of monuments, museums, and great shopping. Most Parisians wouldn't be caught dead shopping on the Champs-Elysees with all the tourists. They prefer to come around the corner of the Arc de Triomphe over here to Avenue Victor Hugo, where there's lots of boutiques, some delicious chocolate shops, cosmetic shops, clothing, and so forth. Now, Victor Hugo is named for the famous author of Les Mis, who actually lived on this street, and fans of Victor Hugo can go down to where his house used to be at number 124. There are other homes in Paris that were once the residence of French poet, novelist, artist, and politician, Victor Hugo, but his apartment in the building at number 124 was his last. Despite having spent 15 years in exile away from France as a result of his criticism of Napoleon, Hugo remained beloved by the people of Paris who, to celebrate his 79th birthday in 1881, marched past his home in one of the biggest parades that France has ever witnessed. The next day, the city changed the name of the former Avenue des Lots to Avenue Victor Hugo. After the Champs-Élysées, Avenue Victor Hugo is the second longest of the 12 boulevards leading away from the Place de l'Étoile and the Arc de Triomphe. 
The shops that line this avenue speak of the privileged nature of this neighborhood. Here you'll find the more than two century old Artus Bertrand jewelers. Next to the finest clothing retailers in this fashionable city. And even the littlest Parisians can dress their best here because the children's retailer Petit Bateau is here at number 64. Perhaps surprisingly, in the middle of all this very French fashion and shopping, you'll also find a gorgeous African art museum just off Avenue Victor Hugo. The Dapper Museum is known for its amazing collection of African and Caribbean art, and it's also a popular place to go for African dance and music performances. So let's go inside. The first room you'll enter at the Dapper Museum is dedicated to contemporary African art. And at the time I visited, there was a series of very striking photographs of African community and political leaders. is open daily from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., except on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and admission is just six euros. The museum takes its name from the Olfert Dapper Foundation. Olfert Dapper was a Dutchman who wrote extensively about Africa in the 1600s. The purpose of this nonprofit is to raise awareness of Sub Saharan Africa's artistic heritage through exhibition and research. The title of the main exhibition during my visit was Design in Africa Sitting, Lying Down, and Dreaming. These traditional, unique, Handmade chairs and headrests have increasingly been replaced in African homes by contemporary furniture, but they remain symbolically very important. As well as a performance space for music and dance, the museum also has a delightful book and gift shop with a nice selection of African crafts that make unique, if not traditional, souvenirs of Paris. As we've learned from our visit to the Dapper Museum, Paris welcomes influences from all over the world and puts them on stage for everyone to see. Let's head over to the other side of Place de l'Etoile to one of the city's most famous concert halls. The Salle Pleyel is right around the corner from Place Charles de Gaulle. It's an Art Deco concert hall opened in 1927 by the piano company Pleyel, and it's one of the most prestigious halls in France. In fact, some of the most exciting composers have performed here, including Wagner, Debussy, Stravinsky, and Ravel, and also musicians like Louis Armstrong and Ravi Shankar. This Salle Playel replaces an earlier one built in the 1830s, located about 15 minutes from here. It saw many important performances, and this newer Salle Playel continues in that tradition. This was considered one of the best classical music venues in all of Paris, but despite this, the building suffered over the years, undergoing several less than completely successful renovations. Finally, in 2004, the Salle Playel closed for a full two years as it was completely restored, bringing the concert hall up to the level of excellence that it has today. The capacity of the Salle Playel was reduced from nearly 2,400 seats to just over 1,900, creating a more intimate feeling, while the acoustics and rigging were vastly improved and modernized. If your schedule does not permit time to take in a whole performance at the Salle Playel, perhaps you'll be able to fit in a visit to the Café Salle Playel at the same address on Rue Faubourg Saint-Honoré. 
Like the musicians in the concert hall, the chefs at the cafe are always changing, offering modern French-style lunch Monday to Friday and dinner on some performance evenings. So whether you come for a delightful lunch while you're out exploring, or a sumptuous dinner with a night of beautiful transcendental music, Salle Playel is one of the many jewels to marvel over in this part of Paris. We're going to see a slightly more revealing stage show in Paris right after this. Welcome back to Paris, a city with a thousand stories to tell. We've been looking in on some of the amazing things to do and see around the Charles de Gaulle Etoile metro station. And we've saved a helping of traditional 19th century Parisian kitsch for last. I'm talking about the Lido Cabaret on the Champs-Elysees. Seven nights a week, you'll be able to catch one of the two nightly shows that are put on by the famous Lido dancers. The first cabarets in Paris appeared at the end of the 1800s, but the cabaret as it's performed today at the Lido is really a product of the explosion of joy that followed the liberation of Paris at the end of the Second World War. of happy, if mildly adult, celebration, mixed with the distinctive Parisian love of fashion and dance, are what define the cabaret as you'll find it today. The Lido's 60 dancers are known for their colorful and revealing costumes, which the troupe change many times per performance. Things can get pretty hectic backstage. Yeah, many costume changes. I changed costumes about 10 times um, during the show. Some changes are very quick, in like a minute, minute and a half. And um, when I change that quickly, I have to change backstage with dresses, like right in the wings. You literally just drop everything and put the next bits on the feathers and run <laughs> straight onto the, onto the stage. You have to have everything laid out. So you have like your ties, your gloves, your hat, and, like sunglasses and feathers and all different bits. And if you mess up one bit, you know, you're going to be late. So you have to be like spot on every time. Performers like Sophie work hard to make it to the Lido. The history and reputation of this cabaret make it one of the most desirable places to dance in a city that places a great importance on entertainment and on history. I'm here only for, for one reason, that is to perform and uh, be a bluebell girl at the Lido. Um, it's like the most famous cabaret, one of the most famous cabarets in the world, so to be here is really a dream and an honor. I trained um, since I was well, three years old, um, after I went to ballet school in England, and I trained and was a, a professional Latin ballroom dancer and did that internationally, and then up to the Lido. <laughs> The dancers work hard off stage and on with rehearsals, workouts, learning new routines, and then the demands of the show itself. The dancers develop their own tricks of the trade, like the super bonding wood glue they use to hold on their stage eyelashes. Everybody here is classically trained. It's really important to have the basics and the strong like core, as they say, and um, because not only are we performing, but we're in nine centimeter heels and have hats on which are like six kilos in weight and big backpacks with feathers, and it's it's quite exhausting, and you have to know how to take care of your body and warm up and stretch before the show. The spectacular show at the Lido includes clowns and magic acts alongside the colorful erotic dance routines that they're perhaps most famous for. Drinking a glass of champagne at an old-style Parisian cabaret may be a little cliched, 
But this is an absolute Paris classic, and I, for one, would be sorry to see the Lido disappear. Many famous names have performed alongside the Bluebell Girls on the Lido stage, including Edith Piaf, Marlena Dietrich, and Elton John. A night at the Lido is the perfect way to end this day of discovery around the Charles de Gaulle Etoile metro station, here in the glittering, glamorous city of light. Let's see what we can discover next time on Paris Next Stop. Six, four,